trying to get better at that. I'm trying to get better at like, <laughs> making sure the mic's in the right place instead of just being like, eh, it's good enough. <laughs> I'm so not an audio guy that it's, yeah, it's been a real tough transition to be like, okay. It I is a to, bit of a challenge. It is, it is, yeah. And I'm so used to doing the video stuff and just totally ignoring the audio and letting it be someone else's problem. Yep. <laughs> and now yep. it's like, fuck, I have to be in charge of the mics <laughs> to make sure it all sounds good. Hell yeah. Episode 57, I'm here with Kevin Jakes. Jocks? How do you say your last name? Jocks. Jocks. <laughs> Hell yeah. I had uh, someone who's Jakes in high school. I almost said their full name, and I guess maybe I shouldn't say full names of people I went to high school with. <laughs> but um, hell yeah. Kevin Jocks from Dreamwake Bassist. Appreciate you coming through, my man. Of course. So we're here today mostly because Memory just came out. So new singling video came out. Yep. Uh, it's available everywhere. Yeah. Before you watch this, before you listen to this, go watch <laughs> that. Go stream that. Check out the video. All streaming platforms. Hell yeah. Dude, that video looks great. Is it the... You. you guys were in like another... Uh, arcade kind of VHS um, scenario. We were actually in a uh, video store. Hell yeah! Okay, uh, one of the few in the states. Um, Interesting. Where was it? It's in Stanford. Okay, it's called uh, Critics Choice. Okay, and uh, we were lucky enough to be able to film there. And uh, hell yeah, you no, know, capture that whole vibe we were it's looking for. Unbelievable! And it follows up perfectly to the arcade that you guys did. I'm forgetting the name of which video it was. Uh, that would be Night Rider. That was the Night yep. Rider video. Hell yeah! That was uh, in uh, Brooklyn at a uh, arcade. Okay, so. I, I almost wonder if it was like the same spot, but just like a back room of it or a different yeah, thing. It was yeah. cool that it was a new spot and a little bit closer to home for you guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. How did that work out? Like, I feel like if you hit up a, a yeah a VHS store, a movie store, they're going to be like, yeah, you can't film a video here. It seems <laughs> like a hard thing to try and sell them. How did that go? Um, well, our director, Alex, uh, mm-hmm. shout out Black Wolf Imaging. Yes. Um, he reached out to them. So we scouted some areas and, you know, we were going to travel out of state for it, but mm-hmm. um Turns out there was one in the, in the Connecticut, so <laughs> he reached out and they were totally down. So, That's wild. Um, you know, we threw threw them good portion chunk of change, and yeah. uh, they allowed us to film from like eight p.m. to like two a.m. Hell yeah! I guess it's a price tag for everything. Yeah, yeah. To some degree. No, they were chill about it though, and uh, they actually watched the whole thing. You That's know, sick. happen. They were there and like supporting. Yeah, it. yeah. That's always makes really me cool. so nervous when I'm filming and like the venue owners on set of like, please just stay out of my way. Please. Like, <laughs> I'm happy that you're excited and want to be involved in this. But like, yeah, sometimes people want to be too involved. And it's like, I know this is your store, but please, I'm not breaking into yeah, yeah. anything. Just let me work. Let us do our <laughs> thing. So out of the way. So it's cool that all went really well. Yeah. No, they were great. So that's sick. Were you guys able or like, are they still renting movies? Still like an active store? Yeah, they're like a specialty store. So they still rent out, but they get in, um, you know, really unique movies that you can't really find anywhere else. Okay. So they have kind of like a specialty with that. So people actually call in from all over uh, to find a specific film, and I guess they have it. So I've never yeah. really thought of that as a business that would still exist. Today. Yeah, it's I know. It's really cool that it happened. It's, it was such a throwback. You and know? Now you've got some <laughs> East Coast videos, you've got your L.A. videos. I guess you've yeah. got to find somewhere in Oklahoma for the next yeah, sort, right? of, <laughs> sort of videos. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe Miami next or something. That'd be the place. I feel like Miami is like the right vibe for you guys. Yeah. It feels up your alley. Yeah. Get the Miami Vice vibes. Yep. That feels like the next step, dude. Uh, most recently, you guys sold it the upstairs. It feels like DreamWake's had oh, so yeah. many successes recently, and I wanted to yeah, dive into all of them. And yeah, selling out the upstairs feels like the place to start. I mean, tell me about that. What, that feels dude. like a, a crazy <laughs> accomplishment to have under your belt. It's it's still insane to me. Um, I, I We were all not expecting that yeah. at all. You know, we thought, you know, we we'll get you know a good handful of people out, and mm-hmm. you know we noticed in the comments like some new people were excited to check us out for the first time, but nah, we we didn't know it was gonna like sell out like that. It's but, unbelievable. Um, you yeah. guys have sold out the underground before, so it feels mm-hmm. like the next step from that. Yeah, um, but I think it is yeah. a little bit bigger of a room, and of course it's not quite home anymore. Like it's mm-hmm. a little bit. Yeah, it feels like a big step for you guys. Oh yeah, no, I'm still blown away by it. <laughs> Do you remember like, your first time playing that upstairs room? Yeah. When was that? That was like, hmm. I think it was 2014. Okay. Uh, with my old band yes. in honor of, um, which Dave was in it, yeah. um, and Bobby eventually joined in. But uh, yeah, first time 2014. I forgot who we were open. I think it was a battle of bands actually. Um, <laughs> what a lifetime ago <laughs> yeah. that must feel like. There was like five people there. You yeah. Know? My would, parents were like, yeah, go get it. <laughs> Everyone needs a family support. Yeah, yeah. Would you have believed that you were then, yeah, 10 years later selling that out? I mean, that feels like a really quick growth from, yeah, Battle of the Bands with no one there. Yeah. And hoping to just, yeah, be amongst your peers. And now, yeah, you're headlining it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, afterwards, imposter syndrome were, was yes. hitting me a bit, but it's, um, it's, it's really cool to hit that milestone. And we're trying to see, all right, what can we do now to yeah. hit that next big... The imposter syndrome bit is a really interesting piece turn. It's something that I'm always aware of with my video stuff of like when you're in the battle of the bands, it's really easy to know what the next step is and really mm-hmm. like easy to be motivated for that and feel like you're ready for the next step. And as this yeah. thing keeps growing, I feel like it's much, yeah, it's much different pressure that's on you guys now to keep going and keep growing. Oh, yeah. you're not 
trying to prove to like these immediate 10 people around you that you're worth something. It's now yeah. like, okay, can we assert ourselves to the Northeast? Can we assert ourselves to the whole coast? What mm -hmm. about the rest of the country? Yeah. Like, has it been, does it feel different now than trying to grow in honor of back in 2014 <laughs> in the Battle of the Bands? It doesn't. It still feels like I'm just starting. You Interesting. Know? It's really weird. I can't really pinpoint exactly, but I don't know. It's still, no matter what, it still feels like I'm just starting out in the band and still doing the thing. You know what I mean? Does that feel like it's how you're, do you feel like the bandmates feel that way too? Like, is there still that? I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm trying to get at this point of like, it's hard to be as desperate as I was back then. And it's yeah. like, I still have the same fire. I still want to grow as much. But like, I talk about how in my first year of shooting, I was at a hundred concerts and it's mm -hmm. like, I would die if I went to a hundred concerts yeah. this year, but there's just like a different fire at the beginning. But it doesn't die. You don't lose that fire as no. time goes on. It's just, it grows and matures. I'm curious. That, yeah. Yeah. As Dreamwake, like what has it grown and matured into out of the Battle of the Bands? I don't know. I feel like we just all have that fire still. Yeah. We're still just grinding it out and just trying to make it happen. You know, oh, yeah. you know, no matter what, like, I don't know, back then, like a couple of years back when our band broke down and, you know, we're just <laughs> saying to ourselves, like, you know, this is something that would break a band and this is something that would, you know, hmm. Everyone call it quits afterwards, but yeah, we just kept going. I mean, you know, we're still paying off, you know, the hit from that. But That's crazy. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, you guys have been through a lot of hits that I think would break other bands. And I think, yeah, maybe yeah. for uh, for someone who's just becoming aware of Dreamwake, it's easy to be like, oh, the things are just working out for them. And it's like, <laughs> no, no, no. There was a good decade of things not working out yeah. for them. And band members having independent difficulties and all the little stuff that goes a long way. Yep. I think the van is maybe the best example of that. Of Yeah, you guys were down in Texas when it broke yeah. down, right? Yeah. So as far away from home <laughs> as possible. That was insane. And, you guys, yeah, what was the full story? I know you spent, like, some time in a hotel. Like, there was a, yeah, yeah what is so the full story there? we just played a show. I forgot exactly where. I think it was Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. And uh, it's 2 a.m., and I had Bob as my co-pilot because we're the night night team. So <laughs> The and, night riders, Yeah, yeah, the night riders, yeah. So, you know, driving down the highway, then all of a sudden I hear this weird noise and, like, a weird humming noise. And then all of a sudden the RPMs just shot up, and I was like, ah. Oh, Fuck. <laughs> that can't be good. All power went out and yeah. the steering went out. And I was like, oh, man. Pull the side of the road, try to start it again. Weird winding noise. I'm like, well, hate to tell you guys, but the van's broke. <laughs> yep. Uh, so we're stranded from like 2 a.m. to like 6 a.m. on the highway, trying to not die. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, finally got a tow truck and then. Um, Got the van towed, then the next day started downpouring, and literally everything that could go wrong was going wrong. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, we have a show tonight, and we have no van. So we're like, all right, what's, uh, well, the show must go on. Let's get a U-Haul, haul the trailer over, and we'll play that show, which was in uh, Houston. Okay. Um, That's like six-hour drive, too, right? It's like, I feel like Yeah, it was like three so or four free. hours, yeah. yeah. It's not a, not a half an hour. And we were like road. crammed like a tuna can in this freaking U-Haul. Like, <laughs> I it was remember like those a, pictures, yeah. Three seater, and here were like four people jammed in there. <laughs> Plus gear, yeah. Um, but yeah, I played the show, ended up flying out the rest of the people, and me and Dave drove all the way back from <laughs> Texas back home. And that must have been the most depressing road trip. And I feel like that's one of those, yeah, we're talking about moments that would break a band. It's like, that's mm -hmm. the car ride that would do. It's not sitting on the highway for four hours. You can tolerate that. Yeah. It's this drive home when you're paying for gas out of your own pocket, like mm -hmm. all the expenses that would incur right then. It's just you and Dave yeah. being like, I mean, they're there would naturally be a conversation of like, hey, is this even worth it? Should we even like fix this van? Or is, yeah. this, is this the universe telling us not to <laughs> not to do this anymore? Yeah, uh, we were just grinding and we we're just coming up, with, you know, just keeping ourselves motivated throughout the whole yeah. hardship. Moment. What helps keep you motivated? I think in, in times like that, it can be really tough yeah, to yeah. keep things going. And there's some, yeah, some inner voice that has to take over there. Pretty much, um, I don't know. What really drives us is like playing the shows, mm -hmm. you know, our supporters and and not working our shitty job, her day job. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to get away from it. It's really it. that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's what keeps the, the flame alive with us, you know. Yeah. We just really love everything all about it, you know. You have to love it. I think that's one thing I've learned is like if, if this was about money, if this was about fame, like there are so many other better options we could have chosen. And, I know. Yeah, for music, for video. Yeah, there's so many other things. And yeah, there has to be that that almost ignorant love. I don't know, like a, a love that isn't quite justified yet where you're yeah. hoping to justify it as time goes on. And yeah. It's about, yeah, staying true to that and trying to stay loyal to that, I guess. Exactly. Um, I like yep. trying to think about doing it for like my like middle school self of like me on the van with like listening to my Avenged Sevenfold in the headphones. It's like yep, yep. that kid would literally never believe that I got to go see Avenged Sevenfold one day, much yeah. less, yeah, some of the other things I've gotten to do. 
Where does this journey start for you then? Like, who is that middle school kid? Are you learning bass in middle school? When does yeah, oh, this man. whole bass journey begin for you? So, you know, back then, <laughs> well, let's go way back. So, Please. <laughs> Day one, <laughs> yes. What hospital were you born in? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Meriden. But, oh, hell yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was, um, so when I was, I, I guess, like four years old, mm-hmm. my sister used to play uh, Backstreet Boys hell all yes. the time. and. I, don't know, I was such a huge fan. I was like, man, I want to be a Backstreet Boy, <laughs> Backstreet <laughs> yep. Boy one day. And um, then as the years went on, it was like I got into, you know, the old emo phase. Mm-hmm. So my big thing was like Good Charlotte and like Simple Plan. Good Charlotte is the one for me. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. And then um, so I was like, you know, I want to be in like an emo band. You know, I want to be like Simple Plan and, you know, play rock <laughs> shows and stuff. But uh, I could never find, find any people to jam with. And um, as high school hit, I went – and did the talent shows, but um, I don't know, still couldn't find a band until uh, uh, senior year. And are you teaching yourself bass? Are you taking lessons? Like, is so, you guitar? What is the what is the origins, I guess, of playing bass there? I started on guitar. Okay. And I uh, self-taught, never took lessons. And then um, did that since I was like eight years old. And then um, as soon as I joined the band senior year, um, I was like, you know, at the time, I was, like, really into, like, the metalcore bands and stuff like that. And I always thought the bass was, like, sick, you know, because mm-hmm. it was, like, really, like, hits hard and the bass tones. And I always had an interest in that. And um, uh, so, yeah, I jumped on that um, starting in, like, 2012, 2013. And the rest is history. The rest that. is history. Hell yeah. <laughs> and now, yeah, now we're selling out the, the Palladium upstairs, which feels, yeah, must feel like a lifetime ago from these boys trying yeah. to be a Backstreet Boy to now, like, you're a little bit <laughs> of being a Backstreet Boy. Um, I like that. Uh, I was, I think, an InSync kid more than a Backstreet Boys kid, <laughs> but they're same, same, oh, same awesome. different. <laughs> um, and then we also got the East Coast run coming up, which I think yeah. is a really exciting next step. So yeah, our last tour ends not so great with this van disaster. Yeah, um, it, it must be tough to regain the confidence then to go back out. Like, was it tough as the, as this tour was getting booked, as it was in the works? Was it tough to be confident entering that phase? Like, it you said you were still paying off this other yeah. Texas van. Like, the biggest challenge was financial. Yeah, you know all the financial stuff, but um. We're trying to be like really like uptight with the finances and the logistics, so yep. we're making it work. Yeah, you know. What are some of the challenges? Like I, the van is one expense. What are some of the other big expenses that are going in to make this happen? Um, merchandise. Yeah. Uh, marketing. Um, that's really the main thing with it because it's such like a big upfront cost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and hopefully the merch makes some money back, but the marketing is a much more like gray area thing of like there's yeah. not a direct return. There's not a t-shirt that you sell. And yeah, I assume the palladium upstairs is a result of some marketing, but yeah, yeah, it's a much different reward, not as clear of a transaction, I guess there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. And then, okay. So we're getting working on that. I think the trailer is another big part of this where mm-hmm. I think I saw you posting about trying to, yeah. Upgrade oh the yeah. Oh, I have a, a funny better. story about that. Please. Yes. <laughs> so um, this happened like last weekend or something like that. So the trailer we have now is a little six by 10 trailer and, um, you know, the crew is expanding. We, we're getting more merchandise on the road. So it's really to the brim now. I know. Like gear. And, um, so I was like, you know, I'm on the hunt for a new trailer. You know, I always want something a little bit bigger. So we have got more room. So I found this one on uh, Facebook marketplace in uh, New Hampshire so I call the guy and, you know, we work a deal out and I'm like, cool, I'm go out and buy it. So I bring my dad along because no one else was free. <laughs> and uh, we're, we hop in the van and shoot up there. And um, about two and a half hours in, um, same symptoms like in Texas. Jeez. All of a sudden, <laughs> the humming noise came back. It's a new van, right? So It's the same van. Oh, same van. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, same noise happened. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> uh, then all of a sudden, lost power and broke down um so here we are stranded on the highway <laughs> jesus <laughs> in new hampshire and um turns out it was the same issue uh the, the shop we brought it to they didn't do it right and but to be honest i'm glad it happens now then on our way to maryland starting our vhs dreams tour definitely know? yeah so, no trailer, no new trailer for me. So <laughs> <laughs> hopefully that's all fixed. Damn, yeah. that feels like a, a real confidence shaker. Where yeah, oh, as yeah. starting to look ahead to Maryland, it's like fuck. The last thing we need is the same problem yep. happening again. So I'm looking. I'm trying to look at the positive yes. around it. So I'm glad it happened now. Then definitely, were you able to get the trailer? Were you able to like reschedule that deal? No, nah, he sold it day of. Damn. I called him. He's like, he's like, oh, your shit out of luck. <laughs> Damn, high demand trailer. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's crazy. And you're also like a car inclined, so you're like aware of these. I feel like to me, if a car blows up, I'm so shit out of luck where at least it sounds like you have some confidence to be like, okay, it's probably this yeah. thing. You can kind of zero in on what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I was able to diagnose it a little bit because yeah. um, literally made the same exact noise. <laughs> That's the worst. And so, your dad's probably sitting there like, Kevin, yeah. there's no way. He's like, well... You know, at least we have us and uh, some crackers and some fruit snacks. <laughs> Something to pass it. And I guess, yeah, closer to home, it's, yeah, middle of the day instead of midnight this time. So it's a little yeah. better circumstance. So uh, Dave ended up driving two hours out to pick us up, which was, <laughs> you know, shout out Dave for that. I'm always shocked by what it takes to be in a band because as a kid, it's like, oh, you have to learn your instrument and you have to go on stage and play. That yeah. seems easy enough. Uh, I wish it was that <laughs> and easy. It's like, no, <laughs> this is what it takes to be in a band. It's yeah. all this bullshit that happens behind the scenes that people don't always get to hear about. Yeah. Uh, and I think it makes me feel a lot better when I hear these stories, which is, yeah, sorry. No, <laughs> sorry it's all good. pain and my pleasure. But I think, yeah, sometimes I'm filming a video and it's like, there's no way. There was one video I was filming where we had uh, like string lights. Those like, yeah, kind of dorm room style yeah, lights yeah. or whatever. And we were planning to film with them. And as I opened the box, they're all in like one huge knot. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those like, we're already tight on time. We're already in place. And then it took us about four hours to untangle these strings. And it was like five of us sitting there pulling on oh, these geez. strings. And it was one of those like, how the fuck did my life get here? How did I end up here sitting on the floor of this warehouse pulling apart string lights? Oh, and man. it's like the video came out fine. No one would ever know that those five hours like fucked our whole day up. We had to yeah pay extra for the rental to be extended, yeah, yeah. Like, all this stuff. And as I look back on those moments, it's almost comforting to be like, oh, this is the whole industry. The whole industry is these stories of yeah, we thought it was going to be kind of cut and dry. We thought we had everything taken care of, and then oh, man. it never is taken yeah. care of. It's never working out that smooth. It's never a straight line. No, no. <laughs> it's a... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hopefully, the road to Maryland and start the VHS dreams is a little bit more of a straight line. I hope so. <laughs> Are these markets you guys have been to before? Uh, no, actually. I mean, some we, we did hit, hit Maryland and North Carolina, uh, but we are hitting down in Florida, which we were supposed to hit on the, the Texas run. <laughs> and I'm so glad to finally, you know, play there because yeah. we had some people that were, you know, disappointed that we didn't, yeah. you know, make it. So this is our comeback. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a good, exciting opportunity to be able to go back and, like, make it right and, yeah, do it do it better, hopefully, than yes. it went the first time. Yes. Uh, what's something that makes you nervous as you look ahead? I guess the van maybe is the obvious question there. But, yeah, I mean, this is your – I guess that is a headline run, and then after is the direct support run. So, yeah, it's the first time headlining, I think. For a tour, yeah. 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 Uh, what's nerve wracking there? What's like makes that challenging for you guys? Man, it's, uh, so much back end work. Okay. A lot of logistics. So, uh, for example, making sure everything runs smoothly. So, I I took on like the tour manager role. So I'm pretty oh, much yeah. handling a lot of that stuff. Okay. Um, you know, making sure you know get the advances out to all the promoters and make sure we have a parking spot. You know, little things like a good merch area and. Um, you know, trying to run the numbers because, you know, starting out, you know, we're not making that much on the road. So sure. we have to um, predict how much we're going to make each night on merch sales and yeah. how much gas we're going to be, you know, using. So a lot of numbers are in play and, you know, hiring, you know, our crew. Mm -hmm. So a lot of expenses and whatnot. So yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges and what makes you a little nervous. But um, what other crew are you bringing out? So we have our sax player. Oh, we're bringing a sax player for the run. Yeah, that's exciting. Can yeah. we say who it is yet, or is that yeah, still yeah. to be decided? So uh, we're bringing Kellen. Hell yeah. Um, he's he was actually in the memories video. Yep. Um, so we were fortunate enough that he's available. Uh, that's awesome. To come out with us, and you know, that's awesome to finally be able to bring a sax player. I know for a while yeah. that was a challenging piece of yeah, trying to figure out who's going to do that and if we're going to do it because I you could backtrack and I think backtracking is the obvious answer, but it, yeah, it feels underwhelming to backtrack it. Is, it is, yeah. It, it's all part of the show now. We, we, we can't yeah. cut that out. Yep. So uh, it's tough. Yeah, it's such a key part of your identity. We're talking about wave core, we're talking about branding, dream with. The sax really is the the most unique part that I think, yeah, draws a, a stray eye to yeah. it and it really makes you guys stand out amongst people. People love other, it. Yeah. Yeah. As they should. It's a great <laughs> thing. It's worth loving. Yeah. Uh, I don't want you to be so surprised. That people love it. I think I think maybe we're we're jaded from another ten years of things not going as well that now when people yeah. do like it, it's like, this is weird. This is new and surprising. <laughs> Um, tour managing sounds difficult. Do you have like a, a role model helping you out with that? Is there someone else helping you coach through that? Or you just kind of learned on the fly um, over the years and now you feel confident taking the reins there? Pretty much I watched a lot of, you know, YouTube videos on it and a lot of, uh, a lot of internet, mm -hmm. you know, 
ads and whatever you call it. I <laughs> YouTube called. University. Yeah, little that's, that's blogs classic, yeah. and stuff, how to, how to do this, how to do that. So it's pretty much like kind of like self-teaching myself with that. And uh, I've always had an interest in all that. Yeah. So eventually I might branch out to helping other bands, you know, once I become a little more, you know, established in that area. Yeah. Um, but Dave has been helping me out as well. And uh, we, we, me and him kind of took the role of trying to get everything in the works with the booking and, mm -hmm. you know, make sure everything runs smoothly. For, and this is, uh, I know you guys announced, I'm um, looking over at the name, Restless Mind Booking. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds like they were probably helped you get the VHS Dreams Tour oh, yeah. set up. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, M Michael has been a huge help. It's just him running it right now. Okay. I know he's trying to take on more people, but uh, he's he's been a, he's been awesome. That's sick. With it. Where does the booking agent end and the tour manager begin in the roles here? Of like, yeah, you're the yeah. one figuring out parking spaces, which in my brain would have been a booking agent thing. But yeah, it sounds like that's yeah, not yeah. how that how that normally works out. So with him, you know, he's working the deals out for us for with the promoter, um, you know. Handling all, like making sure where I, we, you know, get to play the shows and whatnot. Yeah. Um, as for the tour manager, you know, you gotta make sure the day of show runs smoothly. You know, everything that's been promised in the deal memo is happening. You know, because <laughs> I know sometimes people could cut corners on things, and yeah, you gotta make sure everything is, you know, checks all the boxes on the list. I'm sure with playing smaller venues, it also means you're working with people who are less reputable, right? Like I assume when you make a deal with Justin Leach, it's like, cool. He's oh, done yeah. this a million times. We know he's reputable. We yep. know he's taking care of everyone so he can take care of us. Yeah, I wish uh, everyone could be like Justin Leach <laughs> out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember when I did a I did a run of shows with Call at Home for uh, two weeks and it sounds like similar, yeah, style run, East Coast thing. Yep. And yeah, there was a lot of hit or miss of like, we think we're taking care of tonight, but we don't yeah. have Justin Leach's rapport behind this thing yeah, to know yeah. that we're taking care of. And we're not from Maryland. We don't know all these people. <laughs> so we don't know, yeah, who we signed this deal with exactly. We don't know who the who the people are in this yeah. industry, in this scene. Uh, I'm interested. It sounds like we're talking a lot about tour, but we haven't talked anything about on stage. It's all the other stuff that oh, seems yeah, like yeah. it's stressful then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is the, the stage part then like the freedom of the end of the night? Is that your half hour oh, of, yeah. of peace to make it all work? Yep. You nailed it right there. It's, it's the best thing of out of everything yeah. so it makes it all worthwhile yeah so. are there parts of the set that are still like difficult for you are there uh is there a song that you still like as it starts in your brain you're like okay don't fuck up this <laughs> this group here or is that all kind of second nature by this point um it's kind of like second nature um i know uh with you know especially me and dave we, d we don't uh use in-ear monitors so we don't we don't play to a click so it's all you know all the repetition and practicing on our own and mm -hmm. make sure we're, you know on time and all that. So I guess that's one of the challenges, trying to make sure you're always, you know, on time with everything. Mm -hmm. Are any of something that you hope for in the future? Is that like a stylistic thing where you're, yeah, kind of happy without them for the moment? Uh, I definitely want to get them. Yeah. Uh, they're quite the investment right now. It's just more tech. Yeah. <laughs> more things to be aware yeah. of. Yeah. So, you know, we're going across that bridge when it comes. I'm, I'm hoping by the end of the year we could, you know, finally, you know, get, get upgraded live gear and all that. Cause, uh, I know eventually we want to phase out the cabinets on the stage because interesting. Okay, you know, we're you know close to thirty now, and it's like back <laughs> kicking, carrying all that crap. Yeah. So um, it, it'd be nice to do IMs and then have everything self automated um, yep. with all the patch changes and all the all what that. is it, the neural quad cortex? That yeah, everyone quad, talk about is yeah. that the is that the goal right now? That's my goal. Okay, um, I know Dave kind of is kind of leaning towards the axe effects, but I kind of want the quad. Gotcha. So. What's the what's your yeah? What's the dilemma there? To me, they're interchangeable products, but yeah, obviously it sounds like to you guys there's some pros and cons to each one. Yeah, um, I don't know. I I, I feel like with Davey's more confident with the axe effects, while the quad it's still a newer unit. Gotcha. And um, I don't know. With, with my setup, it makes sense because I I run everything on a pedal board and all that and you could slap that right on there gotcha because right now i'm running a dark glass 900 head but you know it'd be nice to eventually you know it's migrate the, to that the next step <laughs> it's interesting that we're yeah adding in the sacks and taking off the caps is like i don't know it just feels like the the modern uh modern style of band is kind of slowly emerging here yeah. Like, yeah we're getting less stuff on stage and adding more people back on stage yeah it, it's funny because i see a lot of younger bands now like you know some bands that open up for us and you know whatnot and they have all this like brand new gear and here we're still playing with a pod HD and like all this. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess that's a new move now. It's always the challenge of when do you spend that money of like in a, in a perfect world, you end up with the quad cortex and you know, all the toys you end up with yeah. the in-ears, you end up with the new heads and all the new instruments I'm sure is another piece of this somewhere. 
Uh, but yeah, for me, camera stuff, there's always this weird challenge of, yeah, when do you spend that money where it's like, I'm going to spend this thousand dollars, but I think in a year or two, it's a better time to spend that thousand than it yeah. is right now. I feel like there's no good time to do it. No, I always go back. Uh, I was, uh, we were talking before this about how I work shows with colleges. And so with the colleges, when I'm photographing a concert at a college, it's a very different thing than shooting at the underground. And the big difference to me there is like the photo pit. <laughs> at the Webster is filled with other people who have shot shows before. So everyone's yeah. kind of familiar to me and also uh, is very aware of how this thing's going to work. Yeah. Whereas when you're shooting at a college, this, oftentimes the people in the photo pit are students who have never been in a photo pit before. Or they, so they don't like they know the etiquette and all that? They don't know. <clears throat> yeah, not at all, which is oh, okay. one of those like, <laughs> It's kind of socially quirky, and I try not to be on my high horse of like, hey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, try, I, I try know to be my helpful. shit. Get out of the way. No, try sure. and be supportive. Try and be educative. And yeah. yeah. Understand that everyone's learning at their own speed. And I was also, yeah, that ignorant at some point too. So yeah. I try and be forgiving there. Where it was more interesting to me is I was at a show one time at a college, and this kid shooting next to me, and I get chatting with him, and he has a red camera. Uh, oh, a red camera nice. for yeah, anyone who doesn't know, we're talking like $100,000 yeah, once this those thing. Are cool. So it's. Yeah, we're talking <laughs> 40, 50 grand for like the brain of the camera, another mm -hmm. 10, 20 for lenses, monitors, like it adds up yeah, so quick. And that's yeah. the big boy camera. <laughs> yes, this is what we shoot movies on. This is what real things are shot on. Yeah. And it was one of those like, you've never been in a photo pit before. What are you doing with $100,000 in your hand? And it, to his credit, he was kind of like, if this thing works, like the thing with the red cameras, you can make money just by having it, right? You'll get yeah. hired just because you have this toy that is so nice and so far yeah. above and beyond. Great investment. <laughs> Unbelievable if it works out. And I always go back to this kid of like, man, if that worked out for him, he is richer than rich right now. He has oh, made yeah. so much money the decade since, or <laughs> it lasted six months for him. And he's now a hundred grand in debt. Ugh. And as we talk about gear upgrades, like that's always the kid in my head of like, yeah, you don't want to be that kid, but you also don't want to be here and still playing on a two hundred dollar guitar or yeah. some dog shit. Like there has to be some moment where you take the leap. Yeah. But when you take that leap, it's a really fascinating game, and it's yeah. There's no right answer, right? Like it, yeah. For me, it would have been the wrong choice to buy the right camera back then. But like, yeah, it's very possible that he opened doors just by spending this money and maxing out a couple of credit cards to yeah. make it happen. And if that's the case, then yeah, he is laughing at me right now. But. I think the more I have no idea what happened to him. Yeah, but I think the more likely outcome is that yeah he probably isn't using that camera anymore. He probably had to sell it and probably was a financial hole. But it's always yeah that that game of like yeah when do you spend the money and how much do you spend how high up the ladder do you jump when you jump because I think I'm sure you've made the same mistake of you go one step up the ladder and then two months later you're like fuck I should have should have waited another couple of months yeah. to get the better version of this toy yeah. instead of yeah doing it now and it's this constant game that I think we all have in different mediums mm -hmm. uh, and there's no real good answer of when to spend the money but no. it's a constant stressor I think for all of us of like yeah fuck when do you invest yeah. in quad cortex it's it's hard to time it you know yeah. what I mean um I know we we got a quote um last year cuz we were planning to upgrade everything last mm -hmm. summer and um turned out to be cuz what we wanted to do was throw everything in fly racks. So, are you familiar with fly racks? Loosely. So, do you remember those racks that people used to put on top of the cabs and yeah, whatnot? Yeah. So, they made it now so it sits in a Pelican case. So, it's easy to throw on an airplane and go wherever. Oh, hell yeah. Go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, we were going to get a couple of those and um, you know, put the whole units in there. So, a couple of quad cortexes and uh, the IMs and mm -hmm. Pretty much have everything self-automated and everything just in those cases. So it's throw on stage, plug and play. Uh, but it turned out to be uh, roughly around twenty five thousand dollar <laughs> investment. So <laughs> I thought you were saying twenty five hundred. No, like, that's no. doable, but twenty five thousand is a little yeah. couple more zeros there. Yeah. So we kind of scratched that for the time that's being. That's insane. Yeah. So I figure we're we're, we're going to upgrade as, as we go. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there's always also the fear there of, of traveling, right? It's not $25,000 that's just going to sit in a very safe place in your house. It's no. $25,000 that has to be in the van and go to the Webster. That's and what at my some fear point is. be yeah. unintended at the Webster. Like, that's just how things go. And yeah, the Webster is maybe the familiar evil. But yeah, the whole country has these corners of like, yeah, yeah trailers go missing. It happens. It is that's, unfortunately a part of our world. Part of the reason why I wanted to upgrade mine, because mm -hmm. mine's still a small, lightweight one, so... I mean, we have our security measures. You know, mm -hmm. I, I throw. I'm I'm Mr. Security, so I double check everything. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I Make got sure a couple. Air tags are hidden and all those yep, things. You yep. know it. Um. But yeah, I mean, 
on top of that, really, um, well, I kind of got lost here. Dude, this place takes <laughs> thoughts out of your brain. Yeah, I'm just like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think the microphone like sucks them out. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep, it happens. It is very normal. But yeah, security is always a tough one for yeah. my oh. camera. It's the same challenge. Uh, gear insurance. Yep. I highly recommend that. We're we're going to be looking into that. But it, it's pretty much insure. You you got to formulate a gear manifest. So what that is, you have every little you know, gear, mm -hmm. every little piece that you bring on the Which road with you. so much more than you would think it it's is. It's very tedious. Yep. Um, so you throw that all on the sheet, and you submit it, submit that to the insurance company, and they specialize in musicians and bands and whatnot, mm -hmm. and then uh, they make sure you're covered. So theft, fire, water damage, everything, they, you know. I've been fortunate with that. It's a piece of mind. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, had a, I had a situation where, yeah, camera insurance saved me a good couple thousand dollars. I don't know yeah. if And it's one of those, like, yeah, thank God I had it. Uh, <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was a, a shoot that I had a mistake on, but I'd gotten the insurance a week before because I was going to be shooting out in the rain. And it was like, if there's ever a time my camera's going to get broken, it's this thing in the rain. It was a paint party in the rain. Oh, geez. So they were shooting, like, yeah, liquid paint out in the crowd. And it was one of those, like, yeah, there's ever a time my camera's going to get fucked up. It's oh, that. Oh, man. So I got insurance, and thankfully, yeah, the week after, I needed it for something that was totally unrelated, but it was, yeah, saved my ass. <laughs> Certainly, yeah, something I would also recommend to people is, yeah, looking into that because it's not – I don't know. I'm always bad at making those. Like, I haven't gotten air tags yet of, like – Oh, really? Yeah, it's 100 bucks that I absolutely should spend. Just put one in my, yeah, case, attach one to my camera. But, like – Dude, it's so I, worth it. I just can't bring my – I just don't care, I guess is the simple <laughs> answer. And it's, like, I'm going to on care one day. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Of, like, it's 100 bucks I don't want to spend, but God forbid something happens. It's going to be $100 that I – won't even have to think twice about it. Yeah, it'll yeah. make itself up so quickly. Yeah, Amazon always has deals on them too. Yep. So yeah, a handful of them for like a hundred and so dollars. So can I ask what other like uh, not to uh, security measures sound like something you don't want to talk about publicly because I understand. No, it's yeah. all good. But uh, what other how else can you secure a van or a trailer in that sense? Like insurance is one, air tags or some kind of tracking device seems yeah. like one. Is it just locks? Like what yeah, else? Yeah, you, you... you know, there's special locks and whatnot, so they're not easy to you know use bolt cutters on. Okay, they have that. They have a coupler lock for the tongue of your trailer so that's attached to the hitch and it, where you put the pin to lock it gotcha. they got a lock there um they have a locking hitch a little pin thing too so you can't yank the pit the the, the hitch off sure um and then they have the, a wheel boot that you could buy on amazon for like 30 bucks you gotcha. slip so every time we go uh, to a gas station or a planet fitness to sleep for the night yep. we slap the little wheel boot on and you know <laughs> That reminds me of when we played Worcester um, a couple years back. We were playing with Enox and whatnot. Um, I put the wheel boot on <laughs> um, prior to us leaving, and um, it, everyone was yelling at me. I had to move the van out of the way because it was in the way. So I was so oh, no. I was so stressed at the moment. So I hop in the van. Turned the van on and then I started flooring it because I was pissed. I smashed the yeah. pedal and forgot the wheel boot was on the trail. <laughs> So now all of a sudden, I see in the re rear view, the, the trailer's just hopping up and down. <laughs> Next thing you know, the wheel boot's like bent in half. And yep. fortunate enough, I didn't, you know, pop the tire. But yeah. Andrew's here yelling at me. He's like, what the <laughs> fuck you do? <laughs> Thankfully, it's the $30 one. So yeah, yeah. World, so, I, so I ended up buying a uh, remove before flight tag to put on the keys. <laughs> and I always put it on top of the steering wheel, you know, whenever there I have it, you know. <laughs> yeah, redundancy. Yeah, never it, again. So. It doesn't make sense to me how trailers are so easy to steal. And I guess, like, I I understand how you could get away with a trailer. I guess unloading the gear then is the weird part to me of, like, it seems like, like your base, I assume you have the serial numbers all recorded, and it seems yeah. like something like that would be pretty hard to disappear. And what I mean is, like, with my camera, it's like it's pretty easy to imagine my camera getting sold to someone who wants a camera. Mm -hmm. But with high-end, like, cabs, it's like, who else outside of our world wants a cab and who has a use for a cab like it, it yeah. seems like it doesn't seem like a profitable thing to steal in the way that a tv or a camera or like yeah some of these more general consumer electronics would be yeah it's a lot of people that just want to, you know a quick flip throw it at a pawn shop or something like that yeah. and i don't know i don't know there, there, it's, it's weird out there i know it's you know, thankfully died down a bit you know especially in st louis you know that, that was a notorious area for gotcha, break-ins okay. but um, it's, it's definitely die down, you know, knock on wood, but it can never be too safe. Yeah. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully no one has to deal with that. But yeah, it's always been a weird one to me of like, yeah, I get why, yeah, I get why you steal TVs. It makes sense. And understand yeah. if you got to put food on the table and 
yeah, that's your that's your option to do it, then please put food on the table. Um, but yeah, the band stuff has always been such a weird thing of like it's such niche equipment that it seems hard to imagine that it just disappears. Or yeah, yeah, if you're in a pawn shop, it seems like it'd be pretty easy to be like, oh, this doesn't. You don't seem like the person who should be bringing this up. Or, yeah, bring a huge ass cab. In yeah, there, no like, one sells a whole trailer worth of band stuff to a pawn shop yeah. unless it's stolen. Like, it seems like a pretty easy thing to to track, and it's always surprised me that it. Yeah, I don't think I've ever it's, heard of someone getting their strange. stuff back. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I don't feel like people ever get their stuff back. I feel like I always see it disappear, and I don't think I've ever seen the follow up post of like, "We found it. It ended yeah. up in Arkansas, but at least we got <laughs> it." I don't know. It's a strange one. Um, Hell yeah. So we got the VHS Dreams tour happening here. And yeah, the tour managing stuff, I think, is an interesting new leg of that. And I'm always surprised by how many different hats everyone has to wear to make a tour oh, like yeah. that happen. Uh, and then following that, we have the direct support for Knight Rider happening. Yep. Uh, so that's another interesting one. And Knight Rider feels like the perfect blend for you guys of like this, yeah, same, a similar kind of style, similar wave core vibe. Like it seems oh, like yeah. the whole package can be kind of catered to, to y'all's tastes. Yeah. It, it was really cool because I, I first discovered that band like, you know, when they first rebranded because they were originally a Affiance. I was so yeah. confused looking at this because some <laughs> of their things says Affiance, Affiance Knight, and I was like, who the fuck is Affiance? Yeah, what yeah, is the yeah. relationship between these two entities? Yeah, I feel, I, well, I feel like they, um, well, from right, what I saw on Facebook, they were having issues with their name, that's, you know, Knight yeah. Rider on there, so that's yep. why they named it Affiance Knight. Yep. Um, but, yeah, they rebranded Knight Rider, and then they came out with that, you know, the whole... The whole look and all that, and I was like, "Oh man, this matches the Dreamwake vibe. I love this." So, yeah. um, I always had in the back of my mind, you know, it'd be cool to do like a run with them or something. Mm -hmm. um, so we reached out to Michael, and he hit them up, and they were down. So then we formulated this whole little mini tour, and hell yeah. Yeah, it's going to be pretty sick. And, of course, in the center of that is the Hartford Homie Show that I yeah. unfortunately have a commitment on. I'm so bummed oh, that I can't man. make it that day because the lineup is the coolest lineup of Hartford, of, like, Connecticut homies ever. Yeah. It feels like everyone's on yeah, there. Yeah, we have all the OGs on there. So. It's so sick. Yeah, it must be real cool to be able to put that together, and it sounds like it's a, a testament to Knight Rider for allowing you guys to kind of have your day in this where mm -hmm. it seems like a headline band could have been like, no, we're going to pick the openers here. Yeah. And for them to trust you guys, I assume they kind of said, yeah, who do you think should be on this? And you said, well, we have a this spring fling tradition what if we combine these two parties together yeah. uh which is sick yeah yeah they're really stoked about it too so i feel like they're gonna have a good time for that hell for yeah that show were you able to select locals for your headlining run and for the other night rider shows or is this um, kind of the one time you guys were given the the privilege of doing that just for hartford okay um pretty much I, i'm not sure if we're having locals on the brooklyn show I, we may um but i know just for hartford we were selecting um you know the people to perform um, but they they're taking over with the whole you know the Buffalo and I believe Columbus and gotcha. Pittsburgh. Has that been a stressor for you as a tour manager on the VHS Dreams tour? Is trying to find locals and pick which locals? It seems like a yeah a real tough balance to try and find. Yeah, I mean, I've I've dug up a couple bands, but mainly Michael and he's been working with the promoters for each date to help find locals. Gotcha. But I have had a couple suggestions on some of the dates and here and there. Yeah, That's me like me and the bandmates kind of like conversed about it and. That's an exciting privilege to be able to have to start, yeah, kind of catering your night. Because I recognize not just the people who are on stage with you, it's the people who you're going to spend your day with in some yeah. sense of like who's going to be in the venue with you at 2 p.m. when you get there before the show and all yep. these other hangs that you have to have where it must be nice to have, yeah, a couple familiar faces mixed in here and there. It's it's great because it's like a, a reunion every time we we all are in the same room, you know, yeah. um, especially like, you know, downstairs stairs in the green room where all, all the homies are. And it's like, this yeah. is sick, you know, it's yeah. like. One big happy family. <laughs> <laughs> and especially, yeah, I think in the wake of all the other bad shows we played throughout our lives, it must be nice to be like, yeah. okay, finally, we can have a sigh of relief and know that we're going to be amongst good people for these shows. Oh, yeah. Um, that's exciting. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know, a really interesting kind of level of touring as this thing continues to grow. And I think that, yeah, being able to headline is a, a privilege. And there's so many other challenges that come with it. And being yeah, able to... it's, it's stressful, but I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we got a lot more lined up for the year, too. You know, Hell that'll yeah. be announced soon. But. Hell yeah. Um, also on the, the Knight Rider kind of conversation sure. here, we mentioned that they're they're a similar brand, a similar kind of Wavecore-esque uh, yeah. branding. I'm always interested with branding a band of like you – there has to be growth and there has to be change in the identity, right? Like you don't mm -hmm. want to just do the one thing forever. And I'm curious where like Wavecore grows into, where there's been a real strong identity built and it feels like it continues to evolve. Is there, does it continue to evolve in the way that we think it will? Is there a conversation of like, 
yeah, changing from blue and pink to red and pink or something. <laughs> like, yeah, how does this thing continue to grow and like keep fresh for you guys? Is it still fresh and exciting for you guys? Like, oh yeah. What how does that brand? Where does that brand go? I guess. So, you know, nostalgia never dies. You know, so that's kind of like our main thing, and it, it's kind of like the the whole gist of it. We're trying to capture, um, for example, let's say you go outside, you know the nice spring weather and you get that smell and it kind of like brings you back to your childhood, you know, that, you know, that feeling you yeah. get. So we're, we're trying to capture that with our music and our brand and identity. So I feel like, you know, eventually we will evolve, but it will be like kind of like in generations in a way. Yeah. Um, I know we're, we'll still hit the whole nineties, early two thousands feel and whatnot, but I feel like we'll we'll always have the the blue and pink I'm vibe for going the new on. Metal for to come <laughs> the new metal. Um, we go country or something. No, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be wild. <laughs> full full Backstreet Boys. Yeah, right. right? Bring the whole thing in. Oh, jeez. But um, it's an interesting challenge. Yeah, and to me, like a, as my show itself, it's like an interesting thing of like I don't want it to become stagnant. I want to make sure that I'm continuing to push it, and also like. I'm growing too. And I'm sure you guys are, yeah. Yeah, Dreamweek is growing. Kevin is growing. Dave is growing. Like, you guys are growing as individuals. Like it's not fair to yourselves to like stay with one thing. Like it's worth yeah. exploring what the other versions of this is. Uh, and I'm laughing that maybe it's, yeah, bringing in a trumpet instead of a saxophone <laughs> or adding in more instruments yeah. on stage. To it would, up in yeah. Royal Elder Hall. It'd be nice to grow that way too. Yeah. You know, maybe add some more different unique, you know, instruments and whatnot to Are there music. instruments that are interesting as a, a next, a future edition? Oh man. I don't know, maybe a whole orchestra at this point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, those Bring Me the Horizon architects, those Royal Albert Hall. Yeah, holders, I saw that. I mean, those are as cool as anything could possibly get. And yeah. Yeah, I guess that would make your life as a tour manager a little bit harder to figure out how to bring 50 more heads with you. Oh, but. yeah. Now, I would love to eventually expand our production mm -hmm. and whatnot, especially live. That'd be wild. What, what, what can we do to add more you yeah. know, to what we have right now? I think that's what you guys have done so great is like you've, found something that is unique but it still feels within the realm of metalcore right it still feels mm -hmm. like uh, the current umbrella of bands of like okay this feels familiar to me but once we brand it once we stick with the branding and stay consistent with the branding now yeah. it becomes a unique thing that we can attach to and that yeah stands out from the crowd and i think there's a yeah a real fine line there of like you want to stay true to the thing because if you're rebranding every six months then like you're fucking yourself right yeah yeah because you're, you're trying to chase the next best thing you know yeah I mean? You got to just be, you know, who you are and, like, just keep at it, you know, and just keep feel, feeling the fire with, with you know, what yeah. you're interested in and whatnot. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of bands, you know, especially, like, younger bands and, you know, you know, my old band, we, we did that too, but, like, trying to, like, copy, well, not sort of copy, but, you know, be emulate. a little bit too, yeah, you know, emulate, you know, the big bands that are out there. Yeah. And... You know, yeah, you might may progress a bit, but you're not your unique self in you know your own brand. It's a real challenging thing, and I've yeah tried to find more comfort in like whatever makes me unique is a thing I should be doing more of. Mm -hmm. And as I'm making music videos, it's like whatever I am interested. Like I, I feel like I'm a mutt between like rap and metal. Like I yeah. I, I think I'm still like a metalhead. Like Crown the Empire is still like oh, my yeah. meta. That 2010s kind of rise core is still like my home. But, like, there's a lot of rap before that and now, like, a lot of, like, bad SoundCloud rap that's mixed in. And, like, I feel like I'm constantly pulling from those influences. And it, at times, has been, like, almost a stressor of, like, how do I combine these two worlds? Which world should I be more loyal to? And now yeah. it's like, no, no, no. What I should be doing is figure out what is good between both of these worlds and how do I pull, yeah, pull those things together and create whoever Peter is. Because Peter isn't either one of these worlds and yeah neither one of these worlds is probably as rigid as i make it seem in my brain like there always is some overlap there yeah um, and i've tried to yeah get better at leaning into like yeah what is unique to me what is something that i care about that i don't think other people care about <laughs> how do i keep exploring that interest yeah um it's always a, a real challenge for us there um my uh night rider <laughs> i guess <laughs> speaking not just of the band but the song this time uh hit a million streams which feels insane as yeah. a as a milestone uh, i did a couple a little quick math here so a million <laughs> to math. me is like unbelievable to to fi like, i don't know what a million means it doesn't mean anything to me it's almost too big of a number to like conceptualize yeah so the way i tried to conceptualize it was like if i pushed play right now and played night rider a million times how long would that be? <laughs> and it turns out that a consecutive million streams of Knight Rider is about eight and a half years. Yeah. And that to me was kind of like That's a, nuts. Oh <laughs> fuck. Yeah. If yeah, where were you eight years ago? And if you pressed play, <laughs> you get to now. And 
Well, you see, Peter, that's why I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That song's been out yeah, yeah. on the low for miles, for years. Uh, but that's just an insane, like, line of people to try and conceptualize. And I tried to, like, look up photos of a million people in a stadium to get a sense of what a million is. And, of course, a million people stadiums don't exist, but there's AI conceptualizations yeah, yeah. of what it is. And it's just mind-numbing to me. I mean, does it it's insane. Does it sink into you? Does it feel different than in an honor of song that had 20,000 streams? Like, does it... Where does this milestone? What does this milestone feel like? I guess it. I don't know. It, it you know, it's weird because you know all these things. Like when we're you know younger, we're like, yo, it'd be so dope if we you know hit this number, blah blah blah. blah. Yeah. But now that we're there, it's like, all right, what can we do now to increase mm-hmm. this? It, it's. I mean, it's an awesome feeling, and I don't know. It, it's. We we always celebrate the little accomplishments and all yeah. that. You know, the big milestones. Were you able to like soak it in? Yeah, um, we we had champagne, you know, Hell in the yeah. fan rooms. So Hell yeah! <laughs> you know, every little thing we, we we crack open a little bottle of champagne. Hell yeah! Uh, we did that for the sold out Palladium and whatnot. But uh, you know, circling back to the numbers thing, it, it's it, it's it's really cool because now like we see the other songs climbing up to that number now, and and you know, Memories is at two hundred thousand now, and that's our fastest that's growing song now, yeah. and. Um, but yeah, seeing Knight Rider hit one million, it's it's still like it kind of like numbs you in a bit, you know what I mean? That's always my my fear, or my challenge of this thing of like, yeah, you mentioned how as as you reach a million, then your head naturally goes to okay, well, what's the next milestone? What's the next thing we can do? What's the next yeah. growth here? And to me, that's like just a dangerous thing. As I look at my own thing, it's like, so then when am I happy? When is this thing done? And like, there is never a done, but it's this weird thing of like. If I'm always looking at the next big mountain, then it's easy to feel like I haven't done anything yet. Mm. And that, to me, isn't a sustainable growth. There has to be a moment where I step back and go, oh, I am at the top of a mountain. This is a pretty (laughs) cool place. And there's Mount Everest and Kilimanjaro and all the bigger mountains around me. But there has to be a moment where you sit back and, yeah, soak in the mountain that you have climbed. I think the champagne is a really good tradition there and a really healthy way to be like, hey, guys, pause everything. Forget about all this other bullshit and just drink some champagne and go, damn. This didn't seem like it was going to yeah, happen. Yeah. It's a cool thing that we did. Um, but it's always, yeah, a challenging game of, like, I think we're wired to want more. We're wired to look ahead. But It's what keeps the uh, you know, flame going. It is. I mean? But there has, but to me, it's like uh, I heard some, uh, some wisdom that was, like, if in that scenario, it goes back to the imposter syndrome that we kind of yeah. started talking about here. It was, like, as that grows, eventually where that thing would lead if, you know, as you keep hitting milestones, and let's pretend that, lightning strikes tomorrow and tomorrow you wake up and there's 10 million views or a hundred million, like some absurd number. It's like eventually where this thing leads, you're sitting in a room with bring me the horizon going, Oh, I don't deserve to be here. And that's not true, right? Like if you made it to that room with the bajillion streams, like you would deserve to be there. Yeah. But if you're always looking at the next mountain, then it's easy to feel insecure no matter Mm. where you reach. And so it's the challenge to me is always like, how do you get to that room with bring me the horizon or whoever the Mecca is and feel satisfied and feel like you belong there. And that's yeah. a, a weird problem to me. And yeah, I tend to put it in the context of athletes of like how many Super Bowls do you have to win before you feel like you can be friends with Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. And I think even if you won six, you would go, yeah, but he won six and then he did it with two different teams and he had this challenge and that like I feel it, like it's celebrating the small wins. Yeah. Or, or the big wins too. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Always guys what with us, you know, we go out to dinner like, you know, again with the sold out show. We actually went out to dinner, Hell yeah. cracked open some champagne. So Hell yeah. It, it's always like just soaking it in, you know what I mean? And just celebrating it. Yeah. And then then back to the drawing board. That's always <laughs> a challenge, right? And I'm sure that the the flip side of that coin is like if you celebrate every win, then like fuck yourself. Like that's not, that's not how this goes. Like you can't celebrate every single ticket you sell. You yeah. can't celebrate the sellout, but like there has to be some line there. And in my own work, I'm always, yeah, torn of like, yeah, what's a milestone worth celebrating? And I guess, yeah, for me, it's like, what band do I work with that then is worth celebrating? Like you, where mm. does this slider work? What video, there's not like a video, when I put out a video, it's so not influenced by my work is what I feel like. And what I mean is like, I can put out the same video for band A or band B and the video is going to do better or worse depending on how these bands do. Yeah. And that's independent of me, right? Like I can work for them, but, and hopefully, yeah, my work grows with the caliber of bands that I'm growing with. But there is a, a fine line there of like uh, with concert photos, it's always like the photos do better when they're of better people. It yeah. doesn't matter yeah. how good the photo is. A photo of Ollie Sykes does better than a photo of whoever's not Ollie Sykes. Yeah, like, yeah. That's just how <laughs> things go. So it's this weird thing of like, 
yeah, what is worth celebrating and when do you celebrate without becoming gluttonous? But you do mm. also need to pat yourself on the back. You do need to pause and go, oh, there is something cool happening here. Yeah. And so I try and do it annually. I try and do it as the year wraps up and I look back at all the stuff I've done and I go, damn, I didn't, yeah, a year ago when I was doing this, I didn't think X, Y, and Z were going to be on my list of things this year. Yeah. So I try and like, yeah, make an active point to to sit and smell the roses. But it is this weird thing of like, yeah, we're always, we're wired to not smell the roses. We're wired yeah. to hit a million and go, what's the next song that's going to hit a million? Is memories going to hit a million? Yeah. What's after a million? And it just, yeah. Um, I always come back to this idea of the boardroom. Like, yeah, how do you sit in the room with Bring Me the Horizon and feel like you belong there? And I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how the answer. Yeah, it, it's it's difficult, you know. And, you know, I, I still have a hard time too because, you know, I'm always giving myself, you know, a hard time, mm-hmm. you know, when things aren't going the way. You know, I envisioned yeah. them to, to go. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's why we always like celebrate the little the little wins and you know. Yeah. So because you know, we all go through all those tough times just to yeah. make, you know. Yeah. Or yeah, for me it's yeah, a project isn't going well. And it's like, well, it's going a lot better than it would have from me a year ago tackling it. Like whatever yeah. problem I'm solving now, like it may not be the perfect solution, but it's a better solution than it would have been exactly. uh, in the past. Uh, but yeah, it's a strange thing to try and feel that gratitude and feel that pride in it without yeah getting complacent. I think oh, it's yeah. always the the flip side of that coin. Um, hell yeah. Um, the oh the other piece of that uh, <laughs> of seeing the band grow is I've been seeing you all pop up on the subreddits a lot, which is another weird the like the yeah I'm, I'm a big fan of Reddit as like an anonymous social media where yeah. I think somehow seeing per- specific people's opinions is like nauseating. But I'm on there too. Through, yeah, it's it's. It's cool. And I'll get info on there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interesting thing then to see, yeah, someone be like, oh, have you checked out Dreamwink? And I'm like, I know those guys. Yeah. Um, but it must, yeah, you guys are on the same side, but it's, you're also seeing your name pop up. Like, yeah. it, it's a strange thing. And I'm sure with good comments mm-hmm. come some bad comments. Yeah. Um, how do you feel like you're able to navigate those two? Where uh, are you able to accept the good comments and ignore the bad? Or do both of them hit home? Do none of them resonate with you? Like, what is what is landed with you? Well, you know, you take it with a grain of salt, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know back then we used to take it to heart, you know, whenever people would like, you know, shit on us or something sure. like that. But, you know, I try to look more deeply in, you know, why they are making that comment or something. Why are, are they hating and whatnot? And, you know, maybe they're going through something in their own personal life. So I'm trying to look at the positives behind yeah. it, you know what I mean? So that that's that's why we don't really take it. We kind of like laugh to ourselves about it, but... Um, but, you know, seeing us pop up on Reddit, though, you know, that's pretty cool. You know, it's, it's a, a lot of the big metalcore bands are on there now. And, you know. Yeah, it's a it's, it's got to be a strange one. And I think I yeah, I try and be ignorant to the comments of like, that's not the opinion that's going to change what I'm doing. Right. Like, no. If they like what I'm doing or they don't like, I'm going to keep doing it in some yeah, sense. Because everything is authentic, you know, because you know, we're not trying to be somebody, you know, we're, we're just doing what makes us happy and, you know. That's a great point. And maybe, yeah, maybe that's where the wave core thing is so much value is back. Yeah. You're referencing that in honor of sometimes tried to be other things. And that's Mm -hmm. where negative feedback can really get in your head where it's, we're trying to do this and they're saying we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. But when the goal is, can we be ourselves? It's like, that's all we can do. Yeah, No one can stop me. No one can have any other say in whether I'm doing this or not, because I know authentically that I am doing it. And there's some, yeah, some ego that can then come with, yeah, with that confidence. Yeah. Uh, which is an interesting, interesting piece there that I hadn't quite considered of like, yeah, negative comments only hurt when you're not being authentic. Yeah. Like you are being authentic. Uh, the flip side there, I'm always, uh, uh, one of the reasons I ask bands about the negative comment thing is because to me, it's like this podcast is the most vulnerable thing that I could imagine doing in some sense. And most of the people has reached are, yeah, peers of mine, friends of mine. So most of the feedback has been good. There's going to be a time where someone comments and goes, yo, Peter sucks. <laughs> he's so bad. He's so unlikable. He's so annoying, yeah. whatever the thing is. And that's a comment that I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to make peace with yet. Because it's like, oh, they are talking about me. It's not a, it's not my art they're talking about. You yeah. can hate my videos. That's all cool. But this is me. This is very much oh, yeah. me. And that's a uh, one level that I haven't quite yeah, yeah. Haven't reached yet. And I hope to reach it one day. And when I do, I'm going to have some other questions to answer there. It is a bit daunting throwing yourself out there. And yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I really love what you got going on. You know, I'm, I'm happy that, that you got, you know, that you're pursuing this too. It's been know? a really fun project. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, it's, I re- identify with bands more, I think is the other piece of this is this is the first time that I feel like I'm in the driver's seat of what I'm creating. And that allows me to relate to you guys a lot better of like, yeah, what is it to go on and book a headline tour? Like, yeah. I don't think I'd ever thought about that. And now as I'm sitting here, it's like, 
oh, I understand a lot more of the mm-hmm. vulnerability that comes with that of like, are people going to show up? Which is <laughs> not something my camera's ever cared about. But yeah. as I'm here, it's like, oh, oh, I get why, <laughs> how these things could add up and snowball and yeah, make life stressful for us. Um, uh, two last questions here. So we're sure. almost to our hour, which is incredible. Time flies. Sick. Um, the one I like is, uh, what are you learning now? So, um, part of this thing, yeah, something from everyone is the idea. We can learn something from everyone. And I'm always curious of like, it seems like you guys are a band that you have everything figured out. And of course Mm -hmm. that's not from the inside, probably what it feels like at all. What's something that you're currently working on either as a bass player, as Kevin is a bass player Mm -hmm. or as Kevin is a tour manager. Yeah. What's something that you're currently in the middle of learning? What is YouTube university? (laughs) What's in your search history right now? So Right now, I am learning how to properly bookkeep, you know. Okay. So all accounting stuff and, yeah. you know, it's tax season now. So <laughs> Don't, don't yeah. say the word. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm currently trying to juggle. And, um, you know, I know last year was a bit difficult, so obviously the numbers aren't great. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, what, what can we do better this, mm-hmm. this year and whatnot. So um, it's mainly like finances. Um, you know, more artist development, you know, how can I be the best version of me, mm-hmm. you know, especially with all these tours lined up and whatnot and taking the stage and, you know, I could be a little more authentic with myself and, you know, be my own brand at the same time. So yeah. trying to navigate that. And um, I'm also uh, going to be starting YouTube soon. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. I, I used to do it back in the day, you know, when I first started, but hell yeah. um, I kind of want to do a lot more behind the scenes stuff and cool. I bought a GoPro and, you know. Hell yeah. I, I filmed some stuff at the Palladium show, so I'm, I'm piecing it together. And Hell yeah. Yeah. You know. um, the finance, or we'll get to the YouTube after sure. the finance part is one I want to dive into because it's such a weird, like, closed door thing of, like, yeah, I'm, for me, it's always, like, how much should a music video cost? And I'm still figuring out what that <laughs> should be. And it's tough because it's not like there's a wealth of people that I could ask and be like, Hey, 10 people, what would you charge for this? And people yeah. often aren't forthcoming with that information. I assume in the band where there's a similar thing of like, yeah, people aren't open about finances, but it doesn't feel to me like it should be as dark of a secret as it's made out to be. Yeah. Has it been tough trying to manage that? Like, cause it feels like with finance, you're kind of forced to go in blind because people don't want to share information. Yeah. Have you been able to, yeah, pick someone's brain who's, yeah, been through similar finances or what's that learning process been like? Cause it feels like a really challenging one. Yeah. Um, well again, you know, I looked up on like YouTube and whatnot and people that are in that spot, you know, and they explain mm-hmm. how to you know navigate those yeah. you know, rough waters with the finances. But yeah, uh, in terms of like music video and whatnot, in, we always sit down with our director and discuss budgets and whatnot and, Mm -hmm. you know, how much we're looking to put in. And, you know, like, for example, our next music video, we were going to travel, but then we decided to cut that out and do it in a different location that's Mm -hmm. a little more feasible with the budget yeah, and whatnot. So it's it's a lot of, you know, nitpicking the little things and making sure everything lines up and get the best quality we can get Mm -hmm. with within our budget. I assume it's also with guarantees, right? It's like, what should a show pay you? And to some degree that requires you to know what this venue has paid other people or requires you to have some yeah, established base of what shows are worth in different yeah. areas. Like it feels like a really it's very challenging tough with thing that. to figure out what a guarantee should be or what the advance should be, whatever the correct verbiage is. There. Yeah. So now that, you know, we got you know, our sax player, we got mm-hmm. the crew and whatnot, it's, it's kind of like right now, since we're still growing and whatnot, you know, we're not, at that point yet where we could be asking for these big, you know, guarantees. Right. We, we try to be reasonable and like ask for, you know, enough to cover our operating expenses. So that's like gas crew, you yep. know, and all that. So, um, that's kind of been like the main, <laughs> main thing with all of that, but it seems like a, yeah, it's a challenge, you know, cause some people don't really understand, you know, mm. especially a lot of like the, promoters that haven't worked with you as well. Yeah. That, that's a big challenge. And they don't know you. Right. And like, mm-hmm. you can't blame them for not yeah. knowing, but it's like, Hey, trust me, <laughs> like, we're yeah, reliable. Yeah, yeah. like you know, you're reliable you know, you're going to show up and you know, you're going to put on a good show and mm-hmm. be professional and easy to work with. But like, they don't know that they yep. haven't learned that yet. Uh, that's the and- tough part of starting out, you know, especially with the VHS dreams tour. Cause mm-hmm. you know, we're in brand new markets, so they, they don't know who you are, you know, yeah. they don't know how you're going to do. Yeah. So, and it's all a game of who you know. And so as mm-hmm. you as you go through the area once, the next time you come back through, if you're playing the same venue, great. Even if you're not, you can say, hey, we played here. 
and then probably guy A will go to guy B and say, hey, how was Dreamwake when they were here? And yeah. then you can start to build from there. But yeah, this kind of step one is a really challenging place to be. Oh, yeah. Um, step one of YouTube is also a very challenging place to be. Oh, yeah. Uh, what are you hoping to, to get done with this? You said like behind the scenes content for band stuff of yeah. Yeah, day in the life kind of stuff? Yeah, kind of like vlogs and whatnot and like behind the scenes with the band. You know, we're going to be hitting the road a lot this year. So I'm like, all right, this is a great, great time to, yep. you know, film some content and I'll be doing some solo traveling stuff too. So, yeah, you know, it's something I always wanted to dabble in a little bit and, you know, become vulnerable with that, you know, yes. allowing myself to, you know, do it and not care what, you know, people think. That was that. my <laughs> biggest challenge of putting a microphone in my face as well. Yeah. So I, yeah. Greatly empathize with you on that one. It's a scary thing to put yourself out there, but I agree that, yeah, touring is the perfect opportunity to get into that. And I think, I think it's one of the guys in We the Kings has a huge like vlog channel running mm. and I'm drawing a blank on which guy it is and it might be the wrong band. But it always struck out to me as like, uh, I think a lot of photographers get into photo by being in bands and they're yeah. on tour going, what, how else can I make gas money tonight? And the simple answer is, oh, I can shoot the local bands. Yeah. Uh, and I think another extension of that is like, yeah, how else can we grow Dreamwake in a way that people aren't growing? How else can we invite other people into the fold here? Mm -hmm. And the vlog sounds like a really interesting way to do that of like, yeah, I brought up the We the Kings guy because to me it's like, yeah, that's a built-in vlogging dream, right? Part of being a content creator is having stuff to create content about. And if you're at home all the time, then you have to start figuring out prank videos yeah, and start going yeah. places. But if you're already traveling, like there's an inbuilt story that all your job is to tell instead of generating the story. Exactly. And it feels like a really good avenue that I'm, I guess, kind of surprised I haven't seen more bands explore. Or it feels like yeah. the tour diaries kind of died 10 years ago. Yeah, I actually watched a couple uh, of bands like, like let's say um, I Prevail, the drummer, he has a vlog yes, yes, yes. style. Yep. And um, the old drummer of Issues, he has a vlog too, and I watch his stuff. Hell yeah, okay. It's pretty cool because it, it kind of like inspires me. Like, all right, this would be cool to do this for Dreamwake, you know, and, yeah. and my own content. So, And it seems like such a good way to, to be organic, right? I think part yeah. of what I've appreciated about the podcast is I can be me here more than I could be me in an Instagram caption or a tweet. Or like exactly. I can be the full entire unedited version of me. And it sounds like the vlog is a similar way to invite people into the Dreamwake camp of like, yeah, you can put up a story of a 10 second thing, but that's a very different thing than like, I was filming us in the green room and here's, mm -hmm. yeah, the full 15 minutes of what the pre-show looks like for yeah. being in Dreamwake camp. Um, hell yeah. That's an exciting piece. Uh, and then my, ooh, one last one I want to end on here. Sure. Uh, I like to ask about life outside of music. So we talked about all the base of all the tour managing stuff. There's so much happening, <laughs> happening here. I am terrible at having fun. I'm so bad at like <laughs> having hobbies and going out to do new things. Uh, so drums has been one golf has been another one that I've picked up in the last oh, really? year of, I'm ass at, I'm such a bad <laughs> golfer, but it's been a really nice hobby to just like go out and just do something that isn't work related. What yeah. are you doing that's not, yeah, not music related, not band related? What are you else are you into? What else makes you happy outside of this stuff? Um, well, I've been uh, trying to pick up on gaming a little more. Hell yeah. Okay. You know, What's the game right now? Uh, I've been playing Oblivion. Hell so. yeah. Hell I've yeah. Been, uh, that's a big, uh, one of my favorite games back then. So yep. I've been picking it up again, trying. And um, I mean, outside of that, I've been just trying to, you know, spend time with friends and family and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So you know, I know I'm gonna be traveling a lot, so I'm trying to spend a little more time with people. Yep. And um, trying to do a little solo travels. You know, I'm I'm planning to go to Korea in June. Ooh, what's in Korea? That is no. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were saying the Niagara Falls, Grand no, Canyon. No. Hell yeah. Okay. What is in Korea? Why are we going to Korea? I don't know. I, I've you know. You're a big they, anime fan? Is that? I guess no. anime is more Japan, but yeah, that's more like, like Japan. But I don't know. I I. I well, I solo traveled for the first time in England last year. Jesus, I didn't know about this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. For what what guy in England? Yeah. Um, well, I uh, my friend uh, my friends Nicora and Luke, they live in England and I met them on VR chat three years ago. That's sick. Okay. And they live in England. And my friend Jeff, uh, he lives on the West Coast, and he was like, Yo, I'm planning to go to England and whatnot. So I was like, shit, I should get my passport because this would be a cool opportunity. So that he rules. flew out there, and I flew there by myself, you know, six hours over to England. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we all met up, and it was, like, really cool. And I was like, damn, I want to keep doing this. Cause that is sick, yeah. Growing up, I never flew anywhere. You know, my first time on a plane was back in 2019. So mm -hmm. I never got to travel, and I've always wanted – that's, like, a big thing with me now. I, I love traveling. So I'm like, all right. And, you know, I had a fear of flying, too. So that was, like, a big challenge for me, trying to overcome that. Yep. So, 
you know, I was like, you know what, Korea should be the next big thing. You know, let's Damn. try that out. Okay. <laughs> what uh what do you remember about England? What stood out about England to you? What was something what was your favorite um, thing you did there? What yeah, what was unique about it? I I really liked London a lot. Okay. The architecture. Um, yes. I've always been interested in England. Uh, growing up watching like, you know, Bear Grylls and <laughs> <laughs> Shaun the Dead and yep. stuff like that. Yep. So um I don't know, I, it, it was always interesting and then we went up to Scotland too, so seeing the oh, castles yeah. and yep. whatnot. So, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, my girlfriend got me more interested in like the whole, uh, you know, Korean culture and all that too. And is she uh, Korean? No, she actually from Philippines. But, okay. Uh, okay. I don't know. She got me into that stuff, so I was like, you know, I'm gonna solo travel over there, check it out. And I'm, I'm big in coffee, so they got some cool cafes over there. Okay. So. And I love the food too. So, hell yeah, that feels like a, a super exotic adventure. But yeah, a good yeah, one. yeah. That uh, I I forget how accessible the world is at this point. In, in our lives. I know. I'm like, yeah, you just have to buy a ticket and you can go. And of course, yeah, getting saving up money for the ticket is one game. But like, yeah, Korea is a really exotic and sick place. Yeah, that'd yeah. be awesome to make that happen. Yeah, it's like a 14 hour flight. But yep, <laughs> my mom is from South America, so we grew up going to South America every couple of years to visit. That's so them. cool. And it's one of those that like, yeah, it used to be an eight or 10 hour night flight kind of. And as an adult, I look back and it's like, I don't know how I would do that as an adult. It's As a six oh, year old, wow. it's like, oh, you just kind of do it. You just yeah, do what yeah. mom tells you to do. And now, yeah, as we talk about, yeah, going to Korea, it's like, damn, that's a that's a flight. That's oh, a yeah. real one. Um, you mentioned the the fear of flying. I just recently went up in a like a private plane for the first really? time. So it was me and the pilot. And that's it was cool. the scariest thing I've done <laughs> in so long of like... When I'm in the big plane, it's like, oh, this feels safe. I can ignore that there's someone flying and just pretend I'm in a bus and close my eyes and it feels like a bus and I'm in a bus. And going up and like looking at the person controlling my life was like, oh, fuck. Oh, this, is, man. this is a lot. <laughs> this was a lot. Jeez. So, yeah. How'd uh, you get that opportunity? Uh, the, the, I went to Texas, uh, went to Texas just now. And so the guy I went to Texas with is, yeah, the head of my production company, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, and he is also into aviation. That's so cool. part of the things he was speaking about is, um, yeah, how the overlap between aviation and like coordinating an event of just mm -hmm. like how aviation requires you to be in the zone ultimately and requires you to trust and communicate and all these skills that a pilot has to have that yeah. then translate back into putting on a successful event. Uh, so I was filming like B-roll for the video we were going up. So he yeah took me up in it. And I trust him with my life, literally, I guess, at this point. But it was still like, a, damn, this is a, yeah, a scary leap to oh, make. Oh, man. Um, and yeah, that then I had to fly to Texas in a real plane two days after that. And it was like, <laughs> I've never Night really thought difference. about flying. But yeah, after that experience, it was a much more like intimate experience yeah. flying. That's uh, so cool, though. I always wanted to do that. And, you know, circling back to Justin Leach, I know he's a pilot and all yeah, that. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'll have to piggyback off that someday. <laughs> Make it happen. Yeah, I think he's taking people up. I think a couple, yeah. I think Jay's gone up with him. Yeah, I think yep. a couple people have gone up with him. Uh, that's so that's, so dope. yeah, it was, it was wild to me. And uh, yeah, just a crazy experience. My grandpa was in World War II, he was in the Air Force there. Wow, that's cool. Uh, and that was the other piece that was crazy to me is like, he never left home, never been in a plane. And then one day he's the person up flying this plane oh, wow. over England after never leaving the country. And like, yeah, he talks about seeing like the Eiffel Tower from the sky. And That's like, so cool. For a guy who, uh, in his own words, didn't have two dimes to rub together, like, didn't have two yeah. nickels to rub together, like then to be, yeah, looking at the Eiffel Tower from the sky is like, Jeez. fuck, what a brave guy. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a scary thing then to, yeah, be in, be in a plane, what, 50, 60 years later and being like, oh, if this is the plane I'm in now, whatever he was in back then is not <laughs> this safe, it's sturdy, it's stable, and reliable. Um, yeah, what a guy. Um, hell yeah. Mission accomplished, my man. Uh, yeah, we get you two. I'm making sure I didn't leave any open ends here, but I feel like we feel like we got everything covered here. Awesome. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, Memories is out now. Go stream Memories. Go watch yes. Memories. Consume Memories. Consume, consume all the Dreamlike stuff. Uh, where else can people find you online? Uh, where can people follow you? Yeah, where can they tell you that they enjoy listening today? We're on Instagram, Facebook, everywhere, Twitter. Hell yeah. So, yeah, Dreamlike CT and Hey Yo Kevo for my personal. Hell yeah. So we got the VHS uh, Dreams tour coming up, and then it's mostly East Coast runs. Yep, East Coast, and uh, we have some stuff in the works too, which will be branching out. Very so. exciting. Yes, that's my my last question here. Is there anything <laughs> else we can we can talk about? But it sounds like there's some stuff cooking up very soon. Yes. So, dude, congratulations on all the growth. Thank it's you. It's been a really exciting time to watch all the Dreamwake success come. And yeah, I know 
I know there's been a, a long road leading up to this, so <laughs> less glamorous time. So yeah, it feels great to see you guys yeah, finally thriving, getting all that you've earned this far. Appreciate uh, that. So hell yeah. Mission accomplished, my man. Episode 57 in the book, Kevin Jacques. <laughs> Jacques. <laughs> all set. Yes. Uh, anything else I want to say? Nah. Have a great day. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye. <laughs>